find ourselves on the final pages of the Bible. Uh, we've been going from Genesis, the beginning, and now here we are in Revelation, if you're new, uh, 44 weeks. And, and Revelation is a book, as we said last week, uh, that many of us want to avoid, right? We see it as confusing, as strange, as in the clouds and ethereal, and as debated. And I was happy to hear last week from many of you that, hey, that was such a helpful intro. I felt like it was very accessible, and many of my Revelation reservations have been disarmed, and I am eager to jump in the Word. Praise God. Great to hear, because guess what? Last week was the easiest week. Yeah, it's, it's only going to get hard from, from here on. So buckle up, get ready. Last week, very direct, very clear, uh, a vision of the risen Jesus, and here he shows up speaking seven letters to his church on earth. As he sees and knows them and their situations and contexts in that day, he sees and knows us in our situations and contexts in our day. And he had specific, straightforward words as a shepherd of affirmation and admonishment and assurance with his promises. How do we live in the in-between of his resurrection and return? That was last week. Well, today we get a vision of the heavenly throne room. And you got to prepare yourself, all right, for some poetic imagery. This is prophecy. This is going to be symbol, symbolism and metaphor, and these different literary devices are going to be used. So you've got to take off your systematic, engineer-loving hat, right, and put on the left brain, imagination, creative, arts-loving person. As you do, uh, we're going through four chapters today, and so I'm going to try to, like a guide, just point out what's most important along the, the tour, but I'm going to need you to hang with me, because there might be some points where you're tempted to just check out, and I'll have to remember, this is not unimportant, right? This is not insignificant, what we're going to see from the scriptures today. These are vital truths for your life. As we saw last week, hey, how do we... Uh, hold fast to Jesus and not let our love for him grow cold, right? How do we make sure that we're not becoming complacent and compromised with the world? How do we endure patiently until his return? How, 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 how? The answer we're going to see today, and it's in seeing something beyond what we normally would see. Uh, Years ago, there was a real popular story that came out Uh, where the main plot was basically uh, involving humanity had fallen, okay, and had been overthrown by a ruthless ruler and his agents, who through a crafty scheme had deluded mankind into believing a lie that they were in control of their own destiny. Do you know where I'm going with this? And so while humans were physically alive uh, and, and thinking all was going well, they were actually immobilized and they were totally unaware that they were caged and, uh, and, and held captive, okay? And, and some humans knew the truth, and they were on a mission to kind of liberate others from this deception, but they needed the one, right? The one who was prophesied by the oracle, a hero who would come on the scene, uh, whose name actually, by the way, literally means son of man, interesting. And this hero, as the story develops, would plunge himself into humanity's bondage to set them free. But in the process, being betrayed by an informant would actually die. Hmm. Only two, three minutes later, be revived, right? By his partner, Trinity. Yes, you know where I'm going now. Oh, okay, now it's clicking. Yes, right? Rising to defeat the great enemy and his agents, he would soar upward into the sky and the city of Zion would be saved. Wow, what, uh, what a storyline, right? Like, some of you are very confused right now. You're like, this is an odd way to give a recap of the story of the scripture. No, that's not what I'm doing. This is called The Matrix, all right? <laughs> Those of you under 30, you're like, I have no clue what you're talking about. That's okay. The rest of us, we'll, get, we'll loan you our VHS, all right? You can go <laughs> check it out. It'll be great. It'll be great. Uh, There's obvious gospel tones in the story, but one of the things that came out of this 1999 thriller was this. People began to ask a very important question. Wait, is there something more to life? Is there something beyond what I'm experiencing? Maybe a, a different realm of reality that's actually truer and actually deeper than what I'm experiencing 
on the surface. There's something behind the scenes if we were to pull back the curtain of what's really, really happening. And of course the answer is yes. (laughs) It absolutely is. In fact, the scriptures are constantly showing us from showing us that from Genesis to, to Job, right? Second Kings, Elisha, Second Kings chapter 6 is surrounded overnight by uh, a, an invading Syrian army. And he tells his scared servant, hey, don't worry. And he prays that God opens his servant's eyes. And in a moment, he sees the angel armies encamped throughout the hills, far more numerous than the Syrian army. There's a different plane of reality the Bible is constantly trying to wake you and I up to. Hey, there's something else, something bigger going on. Well, that's what we're going to see today. Revelation is doing that, right? It's revealing to us this reality in 4K. So here we go, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to see the first scene of this new vision. After this, so clear transition, right? We've moved on from vision 1 last week. We're moving in to vision 2. There is a shift. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice The one that I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, a.k.a. this is Jesus from last week, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Ah, a door kind of inviting him into heaven. Anyone else think lion witch in the wardrobe here, right? Here's the wardrobe door inviting you in. Come further in. Come see this heavenly reality. Jesus is ready to reveal. Now, heaven's an interesting thing, right? Uh, I think many of us really... Um, when we think about heaven, our minds start to go to kind of certain things that we've seen in pop culture or maybe at Mardell, right? Anybody, the 30 minutes in heaven type books or these near-death experiences, and they go, hey, here's what heaven was like. And we get fascinated with what's going to happen there in heaven. We don't have to speculate. We're about to see what actually happens in heaven, right? The scriptures are going to tell us in a spirit-inspired vision. Verse 2, at once I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, and with one seated on the throne. And so in all the vastness of heaven, all the many things that could have captured his attention, he zoomed into focus into something at the very, very center. It's a throne, and the throne is occupied. And it's not with a Roman emperor. And this is exactly what his readers needed to see in the chaos and the craziness of their day. It's what you and I need to see in the craziness and chaos of our day, that God has not been dispatched from his seat. He's on the throne, verse 3. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, rare jewels radiating, brilliance of his character. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald, signifying his covenant faithfulness and his mercy encircling this throne as his presence is beaming. And around the throne, verse 4, were 24 thrones. Seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their head. Um, now this, this is tricky, right? This is where we get into the symbols. What exactly does this mean? There's some debate here. Maybe these are simply angels. Uh, maybe these 24 represent kind of the, the total sum of believers, like the 12 tribes of Israel plus the 12 uh, New Testament apostles, and so it's collectively God's people. Maybe it's a combination of those things. Honestly, it's hard to, to totally understand, but regardless, they're, they're not clothed in their own filthy rags. They've been given pure, righteous, white robes from Christ and golden crowns with his victory and authority. And from the throne, verse 5, came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. So the omnipresence of God, the Holy Spirit, again, being symbolized right there. And not only, though, is God's throne full of mercy radiating with this rainbow, emerald uh, kind of glow, but also on the foundation of the throne is what? Justice, this thunder and this lightning. Like, he is not just full of mercy, he's a just judge also. And that's what's being communicated here. And before the throne there was, verse 6, as it were, a seed graph, glass like crystal. Heaven's floor, earth's ceiling, a transparent and really tranquil scene. There is no chaos. There's no flustering 
scrambling urgency, just peacefulness. All right, let's continue. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion, the second, like an ox, the third, the face of a man, the fourth, like an eagle in flight. Okay, now it's starting to get weird, right? We've got these creatures we can't really put a finger on, but if you know your Old Testament, oh wait, this sounds a bit familiar. Ezekiel described these exact same creatures in chapter 1 and chapter 10. He called them cherubim, these mighty angelic attendants around the throne of God. Same thing described as the, the um, creature who's guarding the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, cutting off the way of access to God, right? Uh, we, we see these creatures show up in different places, symbolized on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, even if you'll remember, symbolizing the presence, the throne of God. And so out of the gate, what I need you to see in chapter 4 is this. The vision is utterly and thoroughly throne-centered. Like, again, often the pictures we get of heaven are very man-centered pictures, right? What comes to our mind, what we focus on are streets of gold or beautiful shores and beaches, amazing feasts, mansions, crowns, being reunited even with loved ones or reunited with pets, right? Half of America believes that's what's happening when we get to heaven. You're going to see fluffy. And so that's what people focus in on, right? And you go, man, uh, uh, and, and listen, some of these things are, are true and real. And I think Randy Alcorn, by the way, has a great book on heaven that describes a lot of these beautiful realities. There's going to be culture, and there's going to be art, and there's going to be leisure, and there's going to be these amazing, spectacular things in heaven. It is not a boring service forever, right? There's exciting things. But that is not what is primary. What is central, the, the epicenter of heaven is what? The throne. And we need to be recalibrated off of this human-centered vision of heaven being this vast vacation resort onto a God-centered view of all things. That's what everything is revolved around. It's not us. (laughs) And listen, when you and I start orbiting our lives around God instead of us, guess what actually happens? We start to actually be filled with the joy and peace and fullness that we were made to experience. Imagine That's a God-centered life and view is far better, I promise you. Now, in this God-centered scene, like I said, it's not silent, it's not sad, it is an ongoing party. It's electric. Take a look, verse 8. The four living creatures, each of them six wings, full of eyes all around within, a day and night never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was who is, who is to come. They praise God for his eternal self-sufficiency. He's the life giver. He is good and he is sovereign. And this praise, hallowed be your name, is unending. It's the opposite of the tarnishing of God's name on earth. That's the picture of heaven. In verse 9, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, guess what? That that praise is contagious because the 24 elders fall down before him who's seated on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns. Any semblance of their own authority or achievements or accomplishments, they go, no, this is nothing in comparison to you. As if to say, you alone are worthy of this. Worthy are you, they sing, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things. And by your will, they existed and were created. He is the creator, and that's the focus of the worship in chapter 4. The scene is on the creator being praised for his life-giving goodness. And notice, this creator is not getting praised forcefully, reluctantly. (laughs) He's not a vain tyrant just demanding compliments constantly. No, this is free, willing, joyful worship happening. But it's just the prelude. There is a a sequel song to the soundtrack of heaven, chapter 5. Here we go. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll 
Okay, so his focus zooms in on what's in God's right hand. A, a scroll, literally in the Greek, biblion. Biblion. With writing inside and outside, sealed with the seven seals, what's inside and written on it is fixed. It will not be altered. Which makes us kind of wonder, wow, what's in the scroll, right? This is a bit mysterious. We begin to go, okay, this is intriguing. Sounds like a pretty big deal. What's, what's going on? Anyone else think Kung Fu Panda, like Dragon Scroll? No, just me? Okay, just me. Very cool. All right. I'm going, wow, this is exciting, right? And I saw a strong angel, verse 2, proclaiming with a loud voice. Here's the question. Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? This isn't any scroll. It is sacred. It is sacred. Not just anyone has the ability or the qualifications to open it. It's going to take a particular credential, a particular authority, a particular person, the one. Which begs the question, I don't know if you asked this this week, why can't God the Father on the throne be the one? Doesn't he qualify? It's the obvious pick, and yet it takes someone else. We'll see why in a minute. Another must arise in this dramatic scene to take the scroll for the answer. And so the search committee is on verse 3. But no one in heaven on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. Here's the predicament. No human, no angel, no creature was fit for the task of unveiling and implementing God's eternal purposes. And so here's the question of all history. Who? Who? Who could possibly uphold both the justice of God while unleashing the mercy of God? Who is holy with all authority in heaven and yet serves as a mediator to mankind on earth? Who can defeat the jaws of death? Who can crush Satan's head? Who can reverse the Genesis curse and raise us up from the dead? Who can rescue us out of sin and bring us back into the garden with God? Who? Well, there's no answer to this dramatic scene, just an empty echo through the halls of heaven, which leads John in verse 4 to do what he ought to do. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. He feels the weight of this moment. Oh, these divine words of life are so there and yet we can't obtain it. And perhaps he's weeping out of his own awareness of his inability and his failure, his sin. Like he can't do it. Perhaps it's more of just a collective human race. No one is able to do that. I imagine it's both. And it reminds me kind of the long, slow feeling you get from reading the Old Testament. Failure after failure after failure, right? Longing for the one, the Messiah to step in. When will someone come? Where is the answer? That's what John's feeling. And the obvious outcome, if no one's able to step up, is awful separation and suffering continue for eternity. That is a hopeless scene. But here comes the turning point, verse 5. One of the elders said to me, weep no more. Which is just like that turning the page of the New Testament moment, right? Flicker of hope. Hey, weep no more. There's, there's a shift. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So when all seems lost, ah, in steps our hero. With an illusion, the, the line of the tribe of Judah to Genesis 49. Let's read Genesis 49. This is an epic prophecy where Jacob, sitting down over his sons, prophesies this about Judah from you become the scepter and it will not depart. It says until tribute comes or, or it, another rendering in the Hebrew is until the one who's worthy of it, until the, the one to whom it belongs comes. So here's the scepter. This ruler's going to come from Judah and he will hold this and, and until it, 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 this will not depart from this tribe until the one who, to whom it belongs, the rightful heir to the throne comes and takes it. And to him shall be 
the obedience of the nations. Wow. Here is that Old Testament prophesied king, the lion of Judah. And of course we know that's the tribe Jesus came from. He has conquered and through his conquering action has now achieved the qualifications necessary to open the scroll. What, what is this conquering? Keep going, we're going to see. And between the throne and the four living creatures, among the elders, verse 6, I saw a lamb? Wait, behold the lion. I saw a lamb. I saw a lamb. A lamb standing as though it had been slain. Here's this lamb standing before, seemingly as if it had been killed, wounded, but not laying defeated on the ground, standing and arising in victory. He was told, he heard there would be a lion. He opened his eyes and he saw a lamb. Do you remember the question of Isaac in Genesis 22 that was unanswered? Where's the lamb? Right? Remember we said that question reverberated throughout the whole Old Testament. Where is the lamb? Until John 1 in steps Jesus and John the Baptist goes, behold the lamb. And here we are again, seeing the lamb, our great Passover lamb who has covered us with his blood so the angel of death would pass over and spare us from what we deserve. Here is that Lamb, what an astounding paradox, because in his shed blood he shielded us from death and conquered. So the conquering lion is the slain lamb. They're one and the same. Jesus is conquered through the cross. He's defeated death through death. And here we see this in beautiful imagery that we have a Savior, y'all, that has scars. How crazy is that? It's this very thing that qualifies him to open the scroll. He took the scroll, verse 7. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, representing the prayers of the saints. You feel the anticipation has come. It's him. Yes, there's one who is worthy. What we are seeing here is the significance of Jesus' death and resurrection from the perspective of heaven. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing a glimpse into the eternal reality and wonder and weight of what Jesus has done in his death and resurrection. And it's beginning with worship as they bow and they're ready to sing and they erupt in a song. But this time it's a new song, verse 9, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals? Why is he worthy? For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. Mm, there it is. <laughs> he is ransomed. He's, the word is to purchase, to buy back. The imagery is of, this, of a marketplace. Just like God ransoming, buying back Israel from Egypt. Just like God through Hosea, buying back Gomer from the slave trade. He has bought us out of the slave market of sin, ransoming us, and the great costly price was his own life. By his blood, he's ransomed us for rescue. What love. Do you see the love in this moment, y'all? Like this wasn't a distant, detached transaction from the eternal God saying, hey, you're, you're covered, I'll pay some money from a distance. This is a personal investment of pain. My life for yours. This is the gospel, is it not? Yes. And a jam-packed phrase right here for us in Revelation that Jesus painfully has purchased our freedom through his death. We're saved from sin and we're saved to God. But look at the next phrase, we're saved into a family from every tribe and language and people and nation. See, Jesus' salvation, it transcends ethnic lines, y'all. It transcends bloodline. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that we come into this newly formed family. It's no longer built around Israel, it's built around Jesus' unifying blood. We're saved 
from and to and into, but we're also saved for. And you have made them, verse 10, a kingdom and priests to our God. Remember we saw this last week, it's Exodus 19. And it's a commission. As a a kingdom, we're not back into the access to the presence of God our King, but as priests, we're not ambassadors of his presence to a lost and dying world. Hey, go take my saving presence to the world. Be a mediator to the world of who I am. We've been saved for a purpose, y'all. Saved from and saved to and saved into and saved for and saved towards and they shall reign on the earth, hinting at our future hope in the new heaven and new earth where the curse of sin is gone, the tyranny of Satan is overthrown for good. Wow. Like this is our gospel song right here in a short stanza. This is our jam, right? Like this is our, the, the beats and the melody and the lyrics ought to be coursing through our veins and exploding out of our lungs. Worthy is the lamb who was slain, who's ransomed us back to God. We're not the only ones singing the rest of chapter five. There's millions of angels joining into this chorus, singing as one. Worthy are you, Jesus, to receive seven things, power, in his conquering of sin and death. Wealth, what does he not rightfully own now? Wisdom, only his mind could derive this beautiful plan. Might, he's stronger than all the forces of hell. And so therefore, honor and glory and blessing all belong to him. He is worthy. And this wave of worship swells even more and it funnels out into all creation singing by the end of the chapter, does this scene stir your affection? <laughs> does it move you in seeing the worthiness of Jesus? I mean, this is an important question for us, right? We, and, and hey, it, we can be free to be honest here. Do you kind of hear me preaching and you read this text and you just kind of yawn a little bit? Is it kind of disinterested as you feel like, well, it's up there, it's out there, it's not in here? Like, this is a vital question. If something in you isn't longing to join in to this celebration, then something's really off here in your soul. There's a flashing dashboard going on in your life, and it's a wake-up call, right? Maybe even as we sing as a church week in and week out, you kind of are not fully there, right? Like, maybe you hum the words. Maybe you kind of sing, but they're empty and dry, or maybe you're just like the type that's like, man, I, <laughs> that's just not me. I'm into the word. I'm into the preaching. I mean, I might as well just podcast the thing. I don't really need the, the corporate singing together and the community and all of that. Just give me the word. Then I would say something's massively off in your soul. There's a major deficiency going on in your spiritual health. Because listen, something is getting that passion. Something's getting that attention. Something's getting that affection in your life. If it's not Jesus, it is something else. You and I were made for this kind of worship. You can't not worship. You can worship things other than Jesus, but you can't turn off the worship switch in your soul. And so something in your life you are seeing worth in, and your whole life is reflecting back the worth of that object or person. Maybe it's a celebrity, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's an organization or a cause, maybe it's a hobby you're pouring yourself into, maybe it's creation itself, maybe it's your, your own worth that you are chasing, your knowledge, your acceptance, your body image, your accomplishments, your security financially, your felt needs. Something is getting your worship. Your soul is singing. The question is, what song are you singing? And it's not a secondary question, you guys, because all eternity hinges on whether you're singing the song of salvation or not. Like, this is really important for you, church. Please hear me. Heaven is not a place for people who just want to escape hell. It's a place for people who love Jesus. 
Are you tracking with that? Yes. yes, that's the scene. And that f- propels us into the last two chapters. Chapter six, we're going to speed through it. Jesus begins to open the seals and execute the scroll. And what we're going to see is very, very intense. The first four seals are all connected. Here we go. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse. And its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Okay, so there's symbolism happening here. What is this white horse and rider as this first seal is open? Uh, Our natural inclination is to think this is Jesus, right? Uh, And later in Revelation 19, the white horse is very unmistakably Jesus. But it's not as unmistakable here. It doesn't say he conquered, and so we tend to think, okay, this is just piggybacking off of what we just heard. But when we read later in Revelation, we're going to get into the trumpets and the bulls. There's some other factors, even the, the rest of the next few seals are going to kind of show us the better interpretation here is that this represents kind of political figures in history, rulers who are trying to expand their territorial kingdoms, trying to conquest the ever power-hungry quest of man, right? These are the human figures across history that that view life like a game of risk. (laughs) Global domination, they're just playing the game, right? Napoleons and uh, Genghis Khans and Putins, right? Like these are the, the people that we're meant to think of in this first seal, which leads us into seal two, and we'll see the connection here. And then, uh, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. Now we have a bright red horse, and its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. He was given a great sword. So this kind of war leads to what? Bloodshed, civil unrest, terrorism, murder, Right? God pulls back his peace that's holding humanity together, and now our sin is getting uncoiled. The hate of the murder was there from Genesis 4, begins to be unleashed without restriction, which leads to seal 3. We have a black horse representing famine. Look at it. Its rider had a pair of scales in its hand, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for Daenerys, and three quarts of barley for Daenerys, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So what we have here is inflation, (laughs) y'all. Right. Not kidding. Ten times the, the normal price for wheat and barley, but oil and wine, products that the, the wealthiest can access are untouched. So you've got an inequity of resources occurring. The rich are living on in luxury, yet the vast majority of people are struggling to make ends meet. That's the famine, the economic hardship that occurs as war and bloodshed happens, which leads to the last of the four, of the first four, we have a pale horse in verses five and six, or I'm sorry, verses seven and eight. Behold, a pale horse and his rider name was Death, and Hades followed him, and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, this horse one with famine, with horse two, with pestilence, and wild beasts severe. So pestilence, we have um, <laughs> epidemics, disease, right? Crazy. No, we haven't seen any of those recently. So what, what you have here is these natural things occurring in kind of succession. These disasters flooding the earth in a major suffering. So here's the question as we read this. Is this now? Are we, re- are we supposed to read this as like this happening currently? And some would say this is a future period, like a, a short time of a certain number of years right before Jesus returns, a tribulation period. Others would say hey, this actually is pointing to kind of the events leading up to and even part of the destruction and overthrow of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70, kind of point to Matthew 24, right? So there's a lot of debate here of what's going on. Others might say, hey, this is simply referring to the church age in general, like everything between Jesus' resurrection and his return right? So there's a lot of different ways to interpret this. I lean towards the last, and and here's why. Has there ever been a time in the last 2,000 years where these things weren't occurring? Where there's wars and rumors of wars? I mean, you can pretty much point to a plethora of wars throughout history, right? There's not a time stamp where that wasn't there. Uh, The second quarter of 2022, Two, the last three months, there's been 6,800 
and 19 specific battles between armed forces on our planet. Again, has there ever been a time where poverty and economic fallout wasn't a reality? And Jesus said, you, you're always going to have the poor. What about epidemics and disease? I won't even ask the question, right? Hello. Now, have these things spiked in certain times? 100%, yeah. But I think it's safe to say these are constant realities in life before the new heavens and new earth. They shouldn't surprise us. Now, we may be insulated from the intensity of them, but a few minutes, right, scrolling through the news, and you're going to see this, this is life. <laughs> this is right now. And even in that, we see the natural consequences of sin. I think a lot of us think judgment is just a future thing, but we need to see, hey, sin has real-time effects. And when Jesus holds back his restraining peace and mercy and says, okay, if you want life with you on the throne, here's what it collectively leads to. And we get pictures of that every day. Including seal number five. It's seal number five we're going to see Christians crying out. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, so sovereign Lord, Sovereign over our suffering, holy and true. How long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? How long, O Lord? You ever ask that? (laughs) Right? The Psalms ask it all the time. How long are you going to wait, God, until you come back and avenge our death? They were given each a white robe, and they were told, rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been Our God hears and he sees and he knows the suffering of his servants. The just one's not idle and he's not indifferent. He's just patient. First Peter says, wishing that none of his enemies would perish, but that all would repent and receive the life-saving grace of Jesus in the cross. He's so patient to not immediately crush his enemies, is he not? Thank God or else you and I would be crushed before we came to Jesus. But he's patient. But there is an expiration date, and justice will come eventually, which is helpful to know if, like these churches it was written to, you're enduring suffering and hardship, and specifically persecution for the name of Jesus. Isn't it nice to know justice will be served eventually? Yeah, that will help you endure, won't it? Seal 6, we begin to see kind of the picture of what the end judgment will look like. The sixth seal, I looked, and behold, and there's these cataclysmic things described, earthquake, the sun turning black, the full moon like blood, the stars of sky falling to the earth, the sky vanishing like a scroll and being rolled up, mountain and islands are removed from its place. So this massive total upheaval of creation, and in that actually similar language Jesus uses Matthew 24 to describe this right before his return. There's biblical unity here to the prophets Ezekiel and Joel and Daniel, Isaiah. This is something the whole story is telling, that there is an end judgment where everything will be turned upside down. Verse 15 will show that nobody escapes this. Rich or poor, it doesn't matter. You cannot hide and escape the judgment of God. And they begin to cry out that the very rocks and stones would fall on themselves. They would rather die than face the one they have rejected and rebelled against and replaced on the throne. God's wrath against sin has come in this sixth seal. And they end asking the question, the great day of the wrath has come, who can stand? Which is an important question for you and I to ask. Who can stand in the wrath of God? Chapter 7 gives us the answer, and we'll race through it as the first three verses show us the angels are prepping for this end judgment, but they're told to pause until God's servants, all believers, are marked with the seal, which makes us think of the Old Testament seal of, again, the mark of the lamb, the blood over the doorpost, right? As well as the New Testament seal, the Holy Spirit himself. This is like God saying, this one's mine, but there's a lot of this ones because the next part, he's told, behold, 
There's 144,000, 12,000 from every tribe. And we go, okay, wow, is this literal? Are we supposed to read this as an actual number of actual Israelites? And, and I think we're, we're best off reading, no, most numbers again in Revelation, if not all, are symbolic. We have the 12 by 12 by 1,000, which completeness showing, hey, this is probably the complete number of God's people of all time. And, and we are also helped to see that by the list of the tribes. Manasseh is included, but Dan and Ephraim are excluded. Dan and Ephraim giving themselves over to golden, or the worship of a golden calf without repenting. Meanwhile, Judah is listed first. He's not the firstborn, but he's also the tribe of Jesus. There's a new orientation of the people of God around Jesus. And whether you're showing up to church and going through the motions or a part of the divine bloodline or not doesn't matter. This is defined now by your repentance and faith in Jesus. Now, this is helpful to see that it's not this 144,000 literal number by the next part of chapter 7. Look at verse 9. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Who can stand? Well, these people can stand. This is God's people. You might think, well, that's different than the 144,000, but it's actually not. Notice John hears the number as 144,000, but he opens his eyes and he sees a great multitude. Just like earlier when he heard the Old Testament Lion of Judah and he opened his eyes to the New Testament reality of the Lamb that was slain. He's hearing the Old Testament picture. He's opening his eyes to see the New Testament reality. This is the true people of God. And it's complete in number, but yet it's innumerable to humanity. It's so vast. You tracking with that? fulfilling God's promise to Abraham, your descendants shall be like the stars in the heaven, like the sand on the shore. Can you even count them? I'll make you a father, a a multitude of nations. That's being fulfilled right here through Jesus. So who can stand in the day of judgment? Well, those who are in Christ. Here they are in white robes, given Jesus' righteousness, holding palm branches, his victory, and they're crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the angels join in singing the song again. The wave of worship keeps going. And an elder turns to John and he says, who are these that are clothed in white? And John's like, uh, don't you know, dude? <laughs> right? Verse 14, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They've washed the robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And therefore, here's our final picture in the text. We haven't had the seventh seal yet, but it's our final picture for today. Therefore, they are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. There's our protection. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb is in the midst of the throne as their shepherd. He'll guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, access to God, protection from judgment, free from suffering. As God the Father himself, in the most personal and intimate way, puts his finger on your face and personally wipes away every tear. What a picture. This is where things are heaven. Is this not Eden being recovered? Yeah, and we get that glimpse Get that picture. So as the band comes up and we we think about moving to do the same thing that they did in Revelation, I want to summarize for us. It's a whirlwind. We just took you through a lot. Here's the four chapters summarized. Chapter four, heaven's joyfully praising God, the creator on his throne. Chapter five, Jesus receives his rightful worship as our what? Redeemer from sin. That's the focus, right? The conquering lion is the lamb that was slain. Chapter 6, now we have the tribulation 
as Jesus' resurrection and, and return, in the in-between period, here's what God's people are going through as he opens the seals to the scroll. Chapter 7, but God's people are protected as Jesus rescues from judgment and removes suffering for good. Who can stand at the last day? Those in Christ. Those who worship Jesus will be protected by Jesus from the wrath of Jesus. This is a throne-centered, Jesus-centered picture of reality. (laughs) This is the truer and deeper realm as we pull back the curtain, and it is all about the worship of Jesus. Revelation is providing a telescope for us, you guys, to bring the magnitude of the gospel into better focus. That's a spectacular weight and reality of what he has accomplished. We might be enlarged with our eyes to actually see how awesome it really is. It's not distant. It's not tiny. He's redeemed us from sin and he's rescued us from future judgment in his life-saving death and victorious resurrection. That's the whole point of today, right? How, back to the beginning. How do we patiently endure evil right now until Jesus returns? How do we make sure our love for Jesus doesn't grow cold and drift over time? How do we make sure we're not tolerating and drifting into bad, enslaving teaching? How do we make sure we're not compromising with the world and, and forgetting to pursue holiness and just getting sucked into the current or or growing complacent in our affections and looking like Laodicea, lukewarm, don't really care, I'm apathetic. We sing, but we don't really sing. I don't really feel much. How do we make sure those things aren't happening? The answer is to see the one who's worthy. To have our eyes opened to his worth. He's worth enduring patiently for He's worth heartfelt praise. He's worth trusting, worth clinging to, worth obeying, worth singing to. He's worth rejecting sin's seductions and the world's earthly comforts. He is worth the praise of our lips and the pursuits of our minds. He's worth the passion of our hearts. He's worth losing anything for, worth losing acceptance for, worth losing a job for, worth losing a relationship for, worth losing money for, worth losing a position for, any earthly trophies. He's worth it because whatever gain I had, I now consider loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I found the treasure. Jesus is better. If we could see that today, what's competing, y'all, for your affections today? I mean, honestly, what, what is your vision? What are your eyes focused on right now? Maybe it's an if only, fill in the blank. I'll be happy when I arrive at blank. Here's some helpful questions for you to kind of identify what maybe you are worshiping, what you're seeing as worthy in your life. You know, maybe what frustrates you? What things fluctuate your emotions each day? What do you complain about or what do you enjoy talking very naturally and turning conversations towards? What do you run to for coping or comfort in the middle of stress? When you have spare minutes, what do you, what do you think about? What do you look to on your phone? These are the things that are going to start helping us see the answer to what we worship. What song are we singing? <laughs> And I get some of you are like, hey, Tyler, that's cool. I get what you're talking about today, but give me, give me something more practical than that. I need the five S's of my application. What do you want me to do today? That's not this kind of passage. What we are called to do today is simple, to see Jesus and his worth. And then to sing about that. So as we, as we get ready to sing, I want, I want to really spur you on in seeing his worth. Because I get... Hey, the last few weeks, I don't know if you've been paying attention, I've been crazy in our world, right? We got mass shootings. We got people battling out of gun control. It's 
Pride Month, we've been slammed with tons of LGBTQ agenda. We've got people losing their minds over their decision on Friday. Ukraine's still getting invaded. Inflation is slamming us. This is reality. This is what's happening. Right? How can I sing in the middle of all of that? Not to mention what's going on personally in my life. How can I sing? And the answer to that is by seeing the one who's on the throne in the middle of it all. He's not thrown off by this. He's not scrambling today wondering how he's going to accomplish his purposes in history or how he's going to fix your problems or meet your needs. He's on the throne. Let's see the one who's on the throne. Would you sing with me, wholehearted, not holding anything back? Let's pray to Jesus right now. God, our Father, thank you that you've shown us a vision of Jesus, who he really is, what really is going on in the throne room of heaven. Help us because we confess, God, our eyes are so often on the world, on the here and now, in the middle of the pressing things in our life and in our world, and we feel that just kind of encroaching on us. And would you catapult our eyes right now on to you, sitting on the throne with the one who's redeemed us by your love, Jesus, and has rescued us from your future judgment. Oh, Jesus, we can't wait to sing to you. We sing to you now. You're worthy. Whether we feel that you're worthy or not, whether we see that you're worthy or not, the reality is you're worthy. And so may we sing with all our affections to you right now. Displace what we have valued as and see as more important than you, though it is lesser and empty in glory. Help us to feel the weight of what is truly glorious right now. In Christ's name, amen.